So welcome everybody to this press conference after the Gimnich. Um, if uh, I'd just like to introduce the minister who will make some introductory remarks and then the high representative and then we'll take your questions. I think there are a couple of microphones going around the room and if you could identify yourself before you ask your question, that would be great. So, minister, please. Yes, uh, welcome to this conference after two busy days. Uh, we've had two, I think, very successful days. Uh, first of all, uh, we have discussed the external European service. Uh, it's very seldom that we have a chance to discuss uh, very deep because normally it's filled up with the things happening in the world. So it was a very good opportunity to get the chance to discuss uh, this as one of the important uh, items. But of course, we also discussed uh, what, what is taking place uh, in, in Iran, in Syria, etc. First, I would like to underline that uh, we are very satisfied with the work that the external service is doing. It's a very young child. Uh, it's only a bit more than a year. We think it's improving. And I think if you count of the number of issues that is dealt with uh, from, uh, from the external service, you'll see that Europe is in a in more and more questions, talking uh, with one voice. Of course, you can find examples that Europe does not speak with one voice. They're easy to find. But uh, it doesn't uh, disturb the general picture that uh, the external service is doing a really good job. Uh, congratulations to that, also to, to, to Cathy. Uh, and the second I would like to say is that uh, we are very happy, also from Danish side, that uh, we agreed uh, on a policy, a, an EU policy for human rights, both that we're going to make a strategy, uh, probably on the meeting, on the fact meeting we have in June, also that we are going to make an action plan, but also that we're going to point out a uh, representative member uh, who has the responsibility for that. Uh, I think uh, it's important that uh, the human rights questions is getting a red threat or a silver threat, or what you call it, uh, in the work we are doing. Uh, so both when we discuss uh, aid and assistance to other countries, and EU is a big donor, when we dis discuss trade and we make big trade agreements, but also when we need to make uh, allies between other countries who are interested in these questions, we need to stand stronger. So it's been a pleasure to be the host uh, these two days. Uh, I think uh, we came out very well on the political items we wanted. Thank you. Well, first of all, can I thank you, Vili, and to the people of Denmark for um, allowing us to be here on what has been an extremely successful occasion, partly because the surroundings have been so congenial and so appropriate for us to have our discussions. These occasions, the Gimnik, uh, are an opportunity for foreign ministers to talk perhaps more quietly than usual uh, and more in depth about the broader strategic issues that we face. And so I invited ministers to talk this time, as Vili has said, on how effective our foreign policy was, the service now just over a year old, how we could address more appropriately the issues of human rights and within that a discussion on freedom of religion and belief, and then today to look at the perspective that says, on the one hand, we have engagement, on the other, we have isolation, countries that we want to perhaps deal with by taking sanctions, and how we look at that spectrum in terms of engaging always with the people in the world and promoting the values that we hold dear, of democracy, human rights, freedom, as well, of course, as protecting our own interests. Um, I think it was a very interesting and successful meeting. Everybody spoke. That's always a good indication. People spoke um, at length or more than once about the issues as they saw them. And within that, naturally, we talked about the topics that have occupied our minds in the last weeks, the last days. Syria <coughs> was obviously top of that agenda. The potential for the Iran talks, which I will 
as you know, lead the issues of Belarus that concern us, uh, what is happening in the broader neighbourhood where, as you know, I've always said, we have the first and primary responsibility to our neighbourhood, how we support countries going through change, how we support change without chaos, uh, the work that is done in developing a comprehensive approach, bringing together the institutions and the member states of Europe to be even more effective in the world. Um, and I think from today we took away a sense that we agree on how we move forward. There's a lot to be done, um, but a sense of unity amongst the European Union to achieve that. I think the first question was Jean-Jacques, if you'd just identify yourself to the speakers, that'd be great. Jean-Jacques Mével, Le Figaro. Um, two quick questions, one on Syria. Um, about the uh, Kofi Annan mission that uh, everybody supports, but uh, everyone is also a bit worried about it. Uh, what is the risks that it could end up, in your view, in a um, half-baked uh, solution, which is a ceasefire, but Assad staying in place? And second question on Syria also. We've seen some defection inside the uh, Syrian military. What kind of support could the EU or the countries bring to those people who are thinking about defecting, but don't, do not do it because, I mean, it's a peculiar regime there. The first thing to say is that Kofi Annan is the most extraordinary man who um, I am absolutely delighted to see taking on this role. And I spoke with him uh, a couple of days ago to wish him every possible success and to offer him as much support as possible. I think he's taking on a mission where his first objective is to stop the fighting, but not his sole objective. His objective is to find a way through this that recognizes the needs of the people of Syria. So it would be unsurprising, or rather it would be, it would be surprising to see him go in and not want to see the first thing to get the fighting to cease. Um, and I hope he's successful in that objective, and I hope he's successful as swiftly as possible, and then we will support him as he moves forward in that process. Um, on, uh, in terms of defections, well, we've been, uh, in a sense, here before. We had a number of defections from uh, senior people uh, when Libya was going through its change. The first thing to say is it's really important that those people recognise that we are um, aware of it, that we support them in doing it, um, and that we recognise the importance of what they have done, um, and that we hope they will be a good example to others who do not wish to be engaged with this fighting, with the murder of people, and who can see that there can be an alternative. <coughs> Hello, I'm Michelle Rasmussen from Executive Intelligence Review in Washington. There has been an increasing calls for military uh, action in both Iran and in Syria. On the other hand, there have been increasing calls for blocking such an action, including a resolution that was just put into the U.S. Congress saying that uh, if uh, President Obama did not agree with, did not go along with the War Powers Act, that he would be liable for impeachment. And then there have been just calls from Lord West and from the Israeli uh, uh, former uh, Mossad chief. So the question is to both uh, Foreign Minister Sondale and Lady Ashton, uh, have you discussed working more with the factions who are trying to go with a political solution or are you going along with the drumbeat for a military solution? Thank you. Uh, no, uh, there's been no discussion about uh, military solutions uh, on either the situation in Iran or the situation in Syria. We are following the political roads. Uh, we are continuing and strengthening the things we do. Uh, if I should just sum up, uh, the first step has been sanctions. We've discussed that uh, and strengthened that and we'll keep doing that as an alternative uh, to a military way. We have asked also the, the opposition to be more gathered 
and to be more clear what we can expect uh, if they take over, because we think it's, uh, uh, it's needed both uh, for the Syrian population uh, if they still, still have a broader, a broader uh, approach, uh, but it's needed for, for, for all of us. And then we uh, use the opportunity also with Kofi Annan's visit uh, to Damascus to put maximum pressure not only on the regime but also on Russia and China to play a, a, a more active role in what's going on. And that's the path that we are following as far as uh, Syria is concerned. As far as Iran is concerned, uh, we're waiting to see if they want to deliver anything by the negotiation table and open up uh, for uh, inspect inspectations. And so that's what Lady Aston is uh, in the front of in the coming days. Just to agree with Billy about Syria, that the road we take is a political solution. The Security Council is important. We have asked Russia and China to consider, um, if you like, their responsibilities in the Security Council to be able to support a resolution that would move us forward with Syria and recognise what we have recognised a long time ago in the European Union, which is that you cannot remain a leader and commit mass murder against your people. And that there's no question that Assad should stand aside and the process should come <coughs> to place that will enable people to live in freedom and democracy and without the fear of terror, murder uh, of themselves or their loved ones. In terms of Iran, my role will be to lead the negotiations with Dr. Jalili, who is my counterpart. It's very clear what we're seeking to do. My mandate is from the Security Council. With me are the P5 plus 1, E3 plus 3, the countries of uh, Russia, China, United States, uh, the United Kingdom, Germany and France. At political director level, they will be there to support throughout. And our purpose is to persuade Iran to move away from its nuclear weapons program. It is one purpose and one purpose alone. And we hope from the contacts we've had that this process could now move forward uh, swiftly and seriously. Yeah, this is Nicolas Busse for Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, question, two questions for Lady Ashton, if I may. First, uh, is the EU preparing new sanctions uh, uh, on Syria and on Iran? Have you already agreed on a location and a date for the next round? Um, we continuously look at our sanctions regime on Syria. So it's not just a, a process that comes and goes. We look each time, each week, first of all, to see that the sanctions are coming into place effectively and that any loopholes or any ways around them are dealt with. That's really important when you're doing the sanctions. And talking with our partners who are also engaged in sanctions and then to look at what more we can do. And you will know and with no surprise that today ministers were looking and asking is there more that we can do, which is ongoing work in Brussels, talking with the member states. Um, on Iran, um, Helga Schmidt, who's here, the political director and deputy secretary general, is in touch with the, the deputy for Dr. Jalili. They will be talking again very soon, in the next day or so, to actually now try and discuss timing uh, and venue for the, for the talks. Lady Eschen, um, Mark Wagner from German Television. Um, I know there is no easy solution to Syria, and I know that foreign ministers should be able to meet to discuss informally. But on the other hand, I have the feeling that many of our seers and readers of newspapers tomorrow will get the impression that while people are slaughtered in Syria, the foreign ministers of Europe, they have dinner in Tivoli and they discuss and discuss. What have you discussed in the last two days to be able in the future to prevent a conflict in the backyard of Europe as one of the most influential political unions in the world without having to wait for the United States or other actors to act? Well, first of all, I don't think the people who read the newspapers mix up the difference between the serious nature of the issues that we discuss and the fact that we met together for dinner. Um, I think that's perfectly understandable. 
And I think you absolutely hit upon the core issue for the discussions in these last two days, but also more generally in all of the work that I'm trying to put together in Brussels, which is how do you prevent how do you prevent and how do you support change without chaos? How do you make sure that you can, wherever possible, prevent what, ha what usually happens, which is that people end up being killed? How do you actually work with governments and people to try and support the changes that need to happen? And how do you support civil society, NGOs and others on the ground to enable them to be active in, and be able to put the pressure on their governments? And how do you persuade governments to be able to respond to that pressure? And that's actually a huge part of the work. And you don't always see the results of that. This is something that we were talking about. That, that when we're successful in helping to keep things calmer, to help things move along, which in our neighbourhoods should be absolutely where we focus, then it doesn't make the headlines. I'm glad it doesn't make the headlines. But it's really, really important. And the two things that I would just mention, one, the work we've been doing with Serbia and Kosovo, which, as you know, I've done a huge amount myself, but many other people too, in helping to support their movement forward towards Europe, but also, in a sense, towards each other. And secondly, to talk about what I've tried to do with what we call the task forces, of bringing together not just the European institutions, but other financial institutions, the private sector, members of the European Parliament, to support countries with a kind of politics meets economics. Political change and reform in support of economic change and reform in support of political change. Getting the right level of investment that helps people's lives because there are more jobs, they get higher education for their children, all the things that everybody wants for their own families. And that's really the core of what I want the external service to be, if you like, a conflict resolution machine. But it also has to deal with the fact that in parts of the world we won't be able to achieve that or we won't know that's going to happen. Some of the things that we've seen happen in the last year were pretty unpredictable. And therefore we also have to be ready to use what we've got, the different things at our disposal, to try and help support uh, the end of violence, the political transformations and change, and to make the one promise that I think is so important from Europe, that we're there for the long term. Just to add uh, shortly to, to Lady Aston's answer, uh, your, your question indicates that if the willingness was there, there would be a quicker way to help the humanitarian situation in Syria. I don't think that quicker way exists. Um, uh, there was a question before about, uh, about, uh, about the military way. Uh, I had no European country talk about that. But even if you did, if you see it from a humanitarian point of view, and remember the situation in, in, in Iraq, for example, uh, the, I think what's important now is to make a situa situation that is not end, ending in, a, in the big class, in the really big class. Uh, so we do what we can. Uh, and you are right, we eat while we do it, but we do it to try to push as much as we can the development. I think there are a few spots of light in the present situation. The one was the four general, generals yesterday, according to Danish press, leaving uh, Assad's army. That was, and three or four days ago, there was uh, a vice oil minister leaving the government. So maybe we see now the start, the beginning, uh, of some of the uh, members of the Syrian military and political uh, uh, groups who try to consider where do we want to be at the end of this point. Uh, do we want to be the one uh, responsible, responsible uh, for, as you called it, the massacres uh, that have taken place. I think quite a few people in Syria are considering that, uh, that question right now. All of Christians and Danish television. Um, some of our colleagues have just spoken to opposition on the ground in Syria, and they're saying that they believe that the talks with Mr. between the, the President Assad and um, 
uh, Mr. Kofi Annan, I'm absolutely ineffectual. They say, in effect, what the President Assad is doing, he's playing for time while at the same time annihilating all opposition. He's, he's really hitting, for instance, uh, the opposition in the northern part of Syria quite hard at the moment. What's your reaction? Aren't we in a situation somewhat similar to what we saw in Libya, where, I mean, the tanks were just like four kilometers uh, from Benghazi when Western forces hit? First of all, we've been talking with a number of different opposition groups, both within and without Syria. And um, if I might, through what you've just said, say one of the most important things is for the opposition groups to come together and to find a way in which they can bring strength. You know, in, in, if you were mentioning Libya, the first thing I'd say is that in Libya, in the middle of what was pretty dreadful fighting, I was in Benghazi talking with the Transitional National Council and with many, <coughs> many members of civil society who had really come together, and that unity matters enormously. It matters in Syria because it's very important that all the people of Syria recognise that what's coming is inclusive. That's a really, really important message that the opposition groups have to give. On the specific question you asked me about meetings between Kofi Annan and President Assad, look, Kofi Annan is a very experienced diplomat, former Secretary General of the United Nations. He will be having the discussions he needs to have, and I will not for one moment try and second guess what those are. As I've said to you, I think his first priority will be to try and find ways to stop the violence and stop the killing and to move on from there. And all I can do at this stage while he's there is wish him every possible success in doing that and give him my full support. Well, I guess in quite a short of time, I'll take one more question at the back there, and then we'll have to wrap up, I'm afraid. Leon Stieber, German Public Radio. Lady Ashton, do you have any indication if there is a resolution on Syria in the Security Council possible? Especially is there agreement with the Chinese and the Russians possible? And what would happen if there is no resolution? Thank you. Well, of course, they've been working, as you know, in New York over the last days and weeks, and that continues. And there will be a debate at the Security Council on Monday. I think the British take over the presidency of the Security Council. And a number of the permanent member ministers, I think, are going to be there. That will be an occasion for ministers to have, uh, if you like, a real push on this. Um, we'll have to wait and see what happens, and I won't speculate what will happen if it doesn't. Thanks very much indeed to the High Representative and the Minister. Thanks very much for coming, and uh, see you next time. Thank you.